So today it's a joy for me to pay tribute to Ed and to enable him to mark the end of Shloshim for Alan. With that, I'm going to transition to the psalm because it's a longer psalm. It's 45 verses, so we need time for me to read it. Tomorrow's also a longer psalm. 105 and 106 are different. You know, what I'm fascinated by in our study of psalms is the fact that of the 150 psalms, each one we have studied has had a little different feel and purpose. Psalm 105 is found elsewhere in Tanakh as well. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, there's a description of King David preparing to bring the holy ark that had been captured earlier by the Philistines to bring it to Jerusalem where later the temple would be built, housing it. And this is a moment of celebration. The bringing of the holy ark created at the foot of Mount Sinai to Mount Zion. And in 1 Chronicles 16, King David, famous as being a poet in his own right and a musician, there it says he commissioned a Levite named Asaf. And we've seen 10 or 11 psalms attributed to Asaf, commissioned Asaf to write song for the celebration. And in 1 Chronicles 16, the first 15 verses of this psalm are quoted. There'll be a few word changes, but really only a few. It's this psalm and then Psalm 96. Now, in terms of the timing of authorship, that would mean that this psalm is very early, written in the time of King David. But we don't, of course, know that precisely because beginning with verse 16, what we have is a description of God in the life of the patriarchs of Joseph, all the way going to the conquest of the land. We don't know when this was written, and if that latter part was built on that foundation, or Asaf wrote all of it. So dating, of course, is as true for all the Psalms, is uncertain. This Psalm is unattributed. And Psalm 105 and 106, the last two Psalms of what the rabbis called the end of the fourth book, are related. Psalm 104 is about God's goodness, God's grace. It's a psalm that's very positive. In contrast, Psalm 106, which we'll look at tomorrow, is about the disgrace of the Israelites citing seven of their rebellions. In contrast, in Psalm 105, we don't hear about rebellion. We'll read about Joseph, but we won't hear about Joseph's brothers and how they sold him. We'll read about God providing food for the people, but we won't read about the people complaining. This Psalm, Psalm 105, is a Psalm of celebration. It is not in history, but from history. It's a midrash, a selective reading of history to extol God. Traditionally, this psalm was read on the first day of Pesach. Robert Alter says he can imagine, but he says it more on the level of imagine, that this was a psalm recited for the people on special occasions in the temple, a reminder of God's presence in the life of the people. At the same time, the assumption of this psalm is that the people knew that history. It's a selective reading. It's not a deep, 
detailed account of God. It's a selective celebration of drawing out moments of the past that brought the people to the present. And there's also a number of embellishments, things that weren't exactly in the Torah, but are surmises, are midrash, are additions by the psalmist to add to the feeling of God's greatness, all leading to a punchline. And the punchline, the final verse, verse 45, so that they might guard God's decrees and keep God's teachings. Hence, there is a trajectory of this telling. The trajectory is, let us celebrate God's goodness and remember our responsibility toward God. But that's only the last verse. This is a psalm of rejoicing. I chose to title the psalm from a phrase in Psalm 38. Egypt rejoiced when, when they went forth. I chose it because we don't have this exact statement in the Torah that Egypt rejoiced. That's a surmise. That's an embellishment. And we'll circle back to a few of the phrases and sentences to see how the psalmist related to the history to create a sense of God's goodness. With that, I have to take a moment to put it up on my screen. One second. All right, now Psalm 105. Give thanks to Adonai. Call upon God's name. Make known among the peoples God's doings. Sing to God, hymn to God, converse of all God's wonders. Let us praise in God's holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek Adonai. Search out Adonai and God's strength. Seek God's face always. Remember God's wonders that God has made, God's wonders and the judgments of God's mouth. Seed of Abraham, God's servant, children of Jacob, God's chosen ones. God is Adonai, our God. In all the earth are God's judgments. God remembers forever God's covenant, the word which God commanded for a thousand generations, which God made with Abraham and God swore to Isaac. And God upheld it to Jacob for a decree for Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan allotment of your inheritance. When they were a small number, very few, and sojourners within it. And they went from nation to nation, from kingdom to another people. God did not allow a mortal to oppress them and reprove kings on their account. Do not touch my anointed ones, and to my people do no harm. And God called a famine on the land, every staff of bread, God broke. God sent before them a man. For a slave, Joseph was sold. They afflicted with shackles his feet. Iron was laid on his neck until the time that his word came to pass. The declaration of Adonai refined him. The king sent and set him free. The ruler of the peoples released him, appointed him master over his house and ruler over all his possessions, to bind his princesses to his soul and make his elders wise. And Israel came to Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. And God made God's people exceedingly fruitful and made them mightier than their foes. Turned their heart to hate God's people, to deal craftily with God's servants. 
God sent Moses, God's servant, and Aaron, whom God had chosen. They placed among them words of God's signs and wonders in the land of Ham. God sent darkness, and it became dark, and they did not rebel against God's word. God turned their waters into blood and killed their fish. Their land crawled with frogs, even in the chambers of their kings. God declared, and there came swarms, lice in all their borders. God turned their rains into hail and flaring up in their land, and smote their vines and their fig trees, and broke the trees of their borders. God spoke, and locusts came, and grasshoppers without number, and it ate up every herb in their land, and ate up the fruit of their ground. And God smote all the firstborn in their land, first issue of all their vigor, and brought them forth with silver and gold. And there was none among God's tribes who was a failure. Egypt rejoiced when they went forth, for their fear had fallen upon them. God spread a cloud for a screen and fire to illuminate night, asked, and God brought quails. With bread of heaven, God sated them. God opened the rock, and waters flowed out. They proceeded through parched places like a river. For God remembered God's holy word to Abraham, God's servant. And God brought forth God's people with gladness, with joyful song, God's chosen. And God gave them the lands of nations and the labor of peoples they inherited so that they might guard God's decrees and keep God's teachings. Hallelujah. All right, so so things to point out to begin with. First is the opening, the give thanks, particularly verses 1 to 5 have 10 verbs, imperative verbs, commands, give thanks, call upon, sing, hymn, praise, search out, seek, remember. So that these 10 verbs, seven are praise, three are request, begins, and you can feel how this would have been sung as a celebration to the people, gathered on the Temple Mount, or how, again, you'll see the first 15 verses are part of the celebratory song as the ark was carried toward Jerusalem. And here in this introduction is what we're praising God for. Verse 5, God's wonders that God had made, right? That's going to be the plagues and the acts of salvation, but also judgments. For ultimately, and we'll see this again in tomorrow's psalm, this reoccurring theme that God is to be praised for God's judgments. Verse 7, God is Adonai our God. Adonai hu Eloheinu. By the way, the phrase... Uh, uh, God is our God. <clears throat> I'll skip that. In all the earth are God's judgments. So God is actively engaged. It's not only in the past. God continues to be a judge known for being fair. God remembers. God swore a covenant. And 9 and 10 the emphasis on covenant will again lead to the punchline. As God fulfilled God's side of the deal of being our God, the one who would protect us, the one who would redeem us, so we too have responsibilities to God. God made a promise in 11, I will give the land of Canaan allotment of your inheritance. And God made this pledge when they were a small people. That mete mispar is a quote of Jacob, Genesis 34, 30, saying to his sons, we are a small, we are vulnerable. They went from nation to nation, 
that's early on. That's the patriarchs as this is understood. The sister wife stories of Genesis 12, 20, and 26 with the more mighty rulers of Egypt and Gerar in which God would say to Avimelech, do not touch. In that case, you know, a matriarch. Here, the phrase, Mishichai, my anointed ones, is not used anywhere else in Tanakh for the ancestors, for the patriarchs and matriarchs. Usually, Mishichai refers to my king. It often refers to David. It refers to the future Messiah, but not, as in this case, for all of the patriarchs together. And now the account begins. So 1 Chronicles 16, verse 22, ends with verse 15. And this is all distinctive now to Psalm 105. God called a famine on the land, every staff of bread broke. Now that could be, again, in the context of Egypt or Israel also. God sent before them a man, right? A slave. Joseph was sold. And verse 18 and 19, they afflicted Joseph with shackles on his feet and iron was laid on his neck. Here's an example of Midrash. This is not in the Torah. We're told that Joseph was put in jail after not succumbing to the enticements of Potiphar's wife who accused him of attempted rape, but that he wore shackles on his feet and, ne and neck. We're not told that. There's a, a Midrash, Breshit Rabbah 87.11, that imagines this, verse 18, as Potiphar's wife, even before he gets to jail, wanting Joseph to look at her. But he refused. He always averted his, his glance so as not to be seduced by her. So the Midrash is she arranged for kind of a razor-like um, yoke around his neck so that he couldn't look away, that he had to look at her. That just, again, Midrash, the embellishing. Here you get feet and neck. A pause. I translate this neck because it fits in context and it's widely translated that way, but others will translate it as his soul, that he was, you know, iron was laid on his body, because nefesh can be life. Literally, it's neck in that through one's neck, breath flows, hence life flows. And this would make sense of, you know, the bot from the t bottom to the top, from his feet to his neck, he was chained. Until the time that his word came to pass. And that word can either be God's word or Joseph's word. The word of his dream of an earlier time. The declaration of Adonai Tzira Fatehu, either refined him, purified him, purged him. Here, too, there's a question. What is that referring to? In what sense was Joseph purified? Some say he was purified from some earlier sin. Rashi and Sforno, the medieval commentators, say he was purified by his ability to refuse Potiphar's wife's enticements. That was an act of self-restraint that allowed him to become the tzaddik that he would know himself to be. All right, we're keeping going. The king sent and set him free. Here, too, the king, usually with a small k, but the Zohar will understand this as capital K, as God sent and sent him free. So ambiguity, again, in Hebrew and in translations, because there is no, in Hebrew, capitalizations of words to know who's being referred to. Set him free. The rule of the people released him, appointed him master of his house, a ruler of his possessions, to bind his princesses to Saul and make his elders wise. 
Here too, I'll keep going, 23, and Israel came to Egypt. Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. That's a reference to Genesis 10, 6, in that Ham, one of Noah's sons, one of those sons would come to reside in Egypt. And so distinctly in Psalms, in three different Psalms, Ham will be used as a synonym for Egypt. And God made God's people exceedingly fruitful and made them mightier than their foes. That's Exodus 1, 7. Turn their heart to hate God's people. This is again about the Egyptians or Pharaoh or God. Here again, hafach is a pronoun, he turned. It's not sure what the he is referring to. To deal craftily with God's servants. That's Pharaoh, Exodus 1.10. Hava nechat ma, let us deal wisely with them. God sent Moses a servant and Aaron, whom God had chosen. Chosen here, implying it's Aaron who will be chosen to be the priest. In that sense, God's Holy One. And these two verses, 27 and 28, they placed among them words of God's signs. So words, that meant Pharaoh was addressed by Moses and Aaron with a warning. And God sent darkness and it became dark. So the plagues now begin, verse 28. And here's a thought. The plagues begin out of order. This is the ninth plague. Why is this account, which will, by the way, list eight of the ten plagues, why does it begin with the ninth? It's not clear. There's room for interpretation. Samson Raphael Hirsch of the 19th century, Germany, will say, because it was the most all-encompassing. Others will point out, Robert Alter, that it attacked the sun, the god of Egypt, all-encompassing in terms of the foundations of their faith. It begins, in any event, as not history. That's my opening line. It's not in history, but from history. The ninth plague. They placed among them words of God. God sent darkness, and it became dark, and they did not rebel against God's word. God turned their waters into blood and killed their fish. And here, too, it doesn't say explicitly in the Torah they killed their fish. This Spornal says this to emphasize that it wasn't just a magic trick of changing the color of the Nile. It was killing the fish. It was more potent. Their land crawled with frogs, even in the chambers of the kings. God declared and there came swarms, lice in all their borders. God turned their rains into hail, fire flaring up in their land. And the plague of hail had fire mixed in and smote their vines and their fig trees and broke the trees of their borders. This is an added, verse 33, Midrashic piece. God spoke and locusts came and grasshoppers. The word yelik is a rare word. It's not clear what it means. Um, in the book of Joel 1.4, it's the only other place it's used, often translated as grasshoppers. They ate up every herb in their land. And now, 36, smote all their firstborn in the land. And God, and now verse 38, God rejoiced when they went forth. Egypt rejoiced when they went forth, for their fear had fallen upon them. Two things to note. In this account of all the plagues, Two plagues were missing. That's the fifth and sixth plague. Devere, pestilence, the bl or blight on the cattle, and shechin, boils, the burning rash. Why are the fifth and sixth plagues missing? al Sheikh will say, because they are the closest to being natural and would have been easily dismissed as just a natural event. Ibn Ezra will add in that regard that these two plagues distinctly, Shechin and Dever, are the only two plagues in that Pharaoh doesn't beg Moses to remove them. So in any event, it's eight of the ten plagues beginning with the ninth plague. And then this Midrashic edition, verse 9, 
Egypt rejoice when they went forth. That's not, again, explicitly in the text. What you do find in the text is that in Exodus 12, 33, the people say, we shall all die, and they're afraid. And in the Song of the Sea, Exodus 15, 16, there's a, again, Tipola lehem matava fachad bigdol, and a great fear fell upon them. So the Egyptians were afraid because of the plagues, but that they actually rejoiced when they left. That is a part of the exuberance of description of the miracle that God wrought. With the explanation for their fear had fallen, the fear of the Israelites or the fear of the plagues. It's not clear what the there refers to. And here's something fell upon them. God spread a cloud. Now they're in the desert for a screen of fire to illuminate night. Often, verse 40, I left it blank. Sha'al is in the singular, meaning he asked. But almost all the translations will say they asked and God brought quails. Again, here, God brought quails because they were complaining. But all the negative stuff is excluded. But there's a very interesting, again, verse 40, comment by Robert Alter. You see, the first word, sha'al, that's in the singular. The second word, vayave, and he brought, he being God, has a vav. And he says, Robert Alter, that there was a scribal error because there were two vavs in a row. It was originally, he assumes, Sha'alu, they asked, Va'yave, and he brought. And because it was a vav and then a vav, one vav fell down. In any event, I left it blank. It's usually, in terms of the pronoun, um, across the board, orthodox, modern, context, they asked. All right, because of uh, limitation on time, we're going to the very end. Verse 43, and God brought forth God's people with gladness, besasson, berina et bichirav, with joyful song, God's chosen. No reference here, by the way, to Mount Sinai. This psalm of celebration of God's wonders doesn't deal with that. It's implied here in part by God's chosen. What we do get in verse 44 is the promise fulfilled. God fulfilling God's covenantal promise of giving the people the land. And God gave them the lands of nations. Va'amal le'umim yirashu. And the labor of peoples they inherited. But the punchline, ba'avur, so that, yishmeru chukav, they may guard God's decrees, vitorotav, yinsoru, and keep God's teachings. The word yinsoru is a rare word for keep. Some of the translations, like the Mitsuda, Amards, and say treasure God's teachings. Um, but usually it's understood as upheld, guard, or keep. It's used also in Psalm 119 to refer to keeping. And then, hallelujah. So to pull it all together, this is a history lesson, but not to provide history in terms of the details as they occurred. Rather, an expression of what we are to feel and experience as a result of our collective memory, a selective telling of God's goodness. In that regard, this psalm is one of five psalms that are kind of history lessons. Psalm 78, 106, 135, and 136. I'll also add that Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlaf, the great-grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, selected 10 psalms for repair of one's soul, and this is one of those 10. Hence, 
Reb Zalma Shachter Shalomi will translate it, although it's long and but a history lesson. And so the closing word, memory of the past informs identity. Identity informs belonging, values, and purpose that gives us confidence and a view as to what is our responsibilities as we look to the future. This psalm, we can see the crowds on top of the mount of the temple gathering together in celebration of being a community. And with this psalm of celebration, reminded that they are part of a covenant with God, a covenant that God in history had fulfilled, enabling them to gather in Jerusalem as a community. And so with that, but moments after 10 o'clock, I delight in seeing everybody on the screens. We have two different panels. Let's take a few comments before we learn from Ed a little bit about his brother, Alan, who, like Ed, was a important educator. Any thoughts in terms of this selective reading? There are many, many verses that I have written here in the margins that are, if you will, the prompts to this collage of memory. Any moments or any thoughts about this uh, selection of memories? So, um, you have to, yeah. okay, Kanner Shula. Okay. I have sort of a general comment to add to your summarizing. Yeah. I think from having read over the years that even during the days of the temple, archeological digs have shown that the people always did stray and they always continued and kept worshiping other deities. Yes. And that was of extreme concern. And so I think many of these Psalms, this one included, uh, really is a kind of a PR piece and a teaching piece. The beginning and many Psalms are set up this way. We are told, give God thanks and sing to God and praise God and all these wonderful things. Then the rest of this very long Psalm is in a sense, the evidence. Here's why. God did this, God did this, God is this, all these wonderful things. These are things that people know, but they have to hear it at this moment when he has a captive crowd to hear. And I think the punchline is exactly that last verse, knowing that he's talking to people. Yes, they came to celebrate, but I know that you're always straying because you have all these little deities in your home, but this is so that in order that you will go guard God's decree and his teachings. So I think that much of these, many of these Psalms, the impetus very often is to bring back the strayers, the straying. So let me build on Shula's insight. First part of her insight is that the Israelites, even those who came on pilgrimage in the first temple, even more so in the second temple, were tempted to polytheism. They were tempted to worship lots of gods. One of the things that I collect, I have a, a variety of kinds of good luck charms or little gods. Here is a beheaded little idol from Israel. Fertility, often therefore holding breasts, the heads are often knocked off. This is as far back as King Hezekiah's time. I have a couple of these. <laughs> Which is to say, in fact, one of the presentations at my rabbi's conference at the moment is a lot of the archaeology demonstrating that the people living in Israel 
were of the place and of their time. The Canaanites among whom they lived had fertility gods. If you've been to Egypt and had the privilege to go to Karnak's temple, one of the wonders of the world, you know that every year they had fertility <laughs> rituals of the gods mating in order to celebrate, <laughs> to have a fruitful year. So in sum, first part of Cantor Shula's insight is that what the psalmist and the writers, particularly of the holiness code, the priest's writing of the Bible, are about fidelity to one God. That was a revolutionary idea, that there's only one creator, and that creator has all the power. There aren't the demons to placate. There aren't all these minor gods to find his friends. But one God who has demonstrated loyalty to us, we took us out of the land of Egypt, enabled us to have our land here from Joseph to Joshua, and we owe God our loyalty. That's the key message throughout uh, the Bible and throughout Psalms. So thank you, Shula, for giving me a context to show my little idol, one of many, um, the worship of feminine power as well as the male power that was and is still part of how people experience um, God and fertility. One more comment before I hand it over to Ed. Um, Rabbi Podwall, go ahead. Uh, you did mention uh, that there's no mention of uh, Mount Sinai and the Revelation, but that really just blows me away that 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 it's ignored in this in this song. The fact that something that we think is so crucial in, in this ancient mind it doesn't come to to be uh, brought forth. So I I too will uh, build on on Rabbi Podwell's insight. You know when we think of a survey of Jewish history from Joseph to Joshua, well, the stop at Mount Sinai and the entering into a covenant of relationship seems like a transformative moment and therefore would be part of the story. Its omission is a mystery. The commentators basically say just that. Nobody has a good surmise as to why. Um, but essentially, at Mount Sinai, the people are entering into obligations with God. This, as a focus, is what God has done for us. And so, therefore, as a focus, it's a celebration of God's goodness rather than a description of the covenant or the, God's, or the people's responsibility. By the way, tomorrow, the partner for Psalm 106, it, Psalm 106 is also a lengthy psalm, 48 verses. It too is a history lesson. If Psalm 105 is about God's grace, Psalm 106 is about Israel's disgrace and the seven major strains um, with the golden calf out of order at the very center of the seven. So we'll see that tomorrow. But the focus and the pull together today of Psalm 105 is selective reading of history. History as memory. That's the way memory works. The difference between history is history is chronological. It tries to get the details right. Memory is not necessarily chronological. It's an expression of what impacted you by events, what you hold on to as defining you because of the past. And that's what Psalm 105 does with celebration, choosing to eliminate the negative in the relationship, focusing on God's goodness. With that, focusing on goodness, I want to acknowledge that when we get to your sites, Norm um, Hunter Kaplan, who is with us, will be doing Kaddish in honor of his father, Dr. Norman Kaplan. But for Ed, if you can unmute yourself, Ed is saying Kaddish for his brother, Alan, the two of them being graduates of UCLA who went on to become educators. Well, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from USC. He was UCLA. Oh, that's right. That's the rivalry. So 
A word in honor of Alan before we say Kaddish honoring him. I just real uh, briefly, uh, my, my brother and I uh, grew up and we came from a very poor family. He looked after me, uh, obviously I'm five years younger. He looked after me uh, throughout my uh, growing up. And the one thing that I like, he had a great sense of humor. And uh, one thing that uh, I can tell you as, as many of uh, early in my life, I had a stuttering problem. And my brother was very, very um, uh, good to me and uh, would take on anybody who would be upset when I had to speak. And I don't tell everybody that, but I, I want to just mention one other thing. And I think it's extremely important. Uh, he went when he, he had COVID. Uh, 19, when he went into the hospital, uh, he, he, knew, he knew, he was told he, that they, they couldn't do anything for him. And he was only in the hospital for three days when he passed away. I had an opportunity to talk to him each of the days by phone and tell him how much I loved him. And thank him for the things he did for me. And I urge anybody that if you have a, a relative or a, a, any relative, uh, take the time now to tell them how much you love them. Thank you, Ed. So I honor the, your brother's memory, Alan, as well as um, Norman Kaplan, as we recite and honor our loved ones through the act of study, concluding with Kaddish. Yitkadal. Yitkadal. Yitkadash. Shemay Rabbah. Amen. Vitar, Vitromam, Vit Nase, Vitadar, Vitale, Vitalal, Shemay the Kudja Barifu, Le Ela mean call Birchata, Vishirata, Tushbehata, Venechamata, Damiran Bialma, Vimruame, Yehe, Shlama, Raba mean Shemaya. Vahayim Alenu Vel Kol Yisrael Vimu Amen. Amen. O say Shalom Yeromab Hu Ya Asay Shalom Alenu Vel Kol Yisrael Vekol Yoshvei Tehel Vimu Amen. Amen. I want to thank each of you for making the time to study together. This is the first time I get to see my wife's cousin, David Lang, my cousin, David Lang, since he did Psalm 101 with us, makes me happy that you're with us. And to each of you again, thank you, thank you. Tomorrow, Psalm 106, entitled, They Angered God, the counterpoint to today. <laughs> so be well. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Be well. Thank you. You're welcome.